Thank you. I'm walking up like there's a microphone here and there's not, but I think you can hear me in the back. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, um, before we talk about railroads, we need to talk a little bit about where we are. Um, there are a couple of things that impact um, why railroads were even interested in this area. Um, so we have to look at how people got here in the first place. Okay. So how they got here is they followed river, uh, river valleys. Okay. So let's see, how is this one going to do this? Okay. Um, so before the railroads and certainly during the railroad eras, okay, the river valleys were the way to get in and out of the area. You had the Arkansas river coming up to Leadville. You could come up over the top of what became Fremont pass, um, and come down 10 mile Creek. Okay, that's what comes right through Frisco, ends in the reservoir now. Used to make a junction with the Blue River and the Snake River. Um, Ten Mile Creek um, is not ten miles long. It was named because it was ten, the uh, confluence with the Blue River was ten miles uh, below Breckenridge. Okay, so it's obviously Ten Mile Creek is longer than ten miles. Uh, the Blue River comes south out of uh, Breckenridge. Um, what had, the railroads had big plans for Blue River because it was going to be the route going north to the Transcontinental Railroad, which was one of their original goals when they built into the area. Um, the Snake River uh, is shorter, but it comes in from the southeast. It joins, um, comes down through the Keystone area and joins the Blue River at Dillon. Okay. So, who came? Well, the people that came here were prospectors, okay? And they came in the, even in the late 1850s, okay? And what are they looking for in Colorado? They're looking for gold, okay? So they were generally disappointed, right? Um, after the Civil War, Okay, prospectors came back. Now, these aren't the same prospectors, but they're prospectors nonetheless. And they came back uh, also looking for gold, but they didn't find much gold here. They found silver, lead, zinc, eventually molybdenum. Um, but they didn't have much luck. They didn't find gold. And whatever ores they had, they didn't have any markets for them. So by 1867, okay, big rush for a year or two, things kind of calmed down here again. Most mining had ceased. In 1870, there were 258 people in the whole of Summit County. Okay. Most of them were on the Arkansas River. Okay. Um, in the wintertime, when the miners would come up here, they left for the winter, okay? So they, many of them, most of them, never came back. It was their one shot. So they went off. They weren't the ones that came back in the spring. Different crops altogether. This happened year after year after year. Now, also, when the early days of mining were happening, there was there wasn't any law up here to speak of. Um, the area was, a, Colorado became a territory in 1861. That didn't mean a lot out here. The only activities were mining activities, okay? So uh, common law provided very little protection for the miners and their mining operations. So there were some mining districts formed by various people in various areas. Most of the time it helped regulate some things, but it dealt mostly with small mine claims, which were the norm in the early days. But in 1875, William Pollock, okay, a local out of 10 Mile District uh, lore, he and some others created the Consolidated 10 Mile Mining District. Okay? And they did that out of a hodgepodge of older, smaller districts. That was a huge step forward in managing how you recorded your mines, how you protected your mining operations, how mining conflicts were resolved, that sort of thing. Okay? But still, it didn't do anything to deal with 
markets. So what frustrated the development of mining was the lack of a place to sell your ore. Okay. So in 1877, so a couple years later, 1877, the St. Louis Company moves a smelter from Alma to Oro City, which is basically Leadville, just east of Leadville. Um, this created a market for ore finally, but remember in 1877, the 10 Mile District still had no towns, no farms, no railroads, no telegraphs, no roads to speak of, okay? But Leadville was booming already, okay? So Leadville, by 1880, Leadville has 15,000 people, okay? Didn't keep them for too long, but, but 15,000 people. The metropolis on, in 10 Mile uh, District was Kokomo, so still a ways from here, okay? Almost up uh, to Fremont Pass. Um, the census of 1880 there uh, showed 811 people. So that was substantial in those days. 51 were women, 65 were children. Okay, so minors. Okay. Now, in the wintertime, that population dropped to 200. Okay, because again, no support, no supplies, most miners left in the winter. Okay. Frisco was thought to be inhabited from about 1875. Different stories, but one of the Racine brothers from Kokomo supposedly built a cabin down here. There are different, different names in, in the original history. I'm not going to go into all those because my biggest problem today is going to be getting this done in my allotted time. Okay. Um, so the, the first post office in Frisco was in 1879. Okay. Still no railroad to support it. There were wagon roads coming from different directions, inter, you know, intermittent service to the post office. Um, the history of railroads in the area uh, really starts in 1879, okay? Because that's when um, several railroads formed what was called the Tripartite Agreement, or the Treaty of Boston. And it also involved a joint operating agreement. And you would remember the Royal Gorge Wars, okay, railroad wars. So what this settled was that the Santa Fe Railroad got the Raton Pass route into New Mexico. Rio Grande was shut off from that. Rio Grande got the right to come up Arkansas River. They were headed for Leadville. What the South Park Railroad got out of this um, was access to Leadville by a shared route, they were gonna operate on the Rio Grande line from Buena Vista uh, to Leadville. And they did that because Jay Gould had his hands in both of those railroads and he didn't see any reason that both of those would invest in parallel routes between ba Buena Vista and Leadville. Um, so with those agreements in place, the Rio Grande was racing to get, they were still down at Canyon City. Okay. But they were racing to get to Leadville, and they did that fairly quickly, um, and they did it for two reasons. One was that the Santa Fe had already graded a lot of the route because they had intended to come to Leadville. Okay. Um, so they inherited the graded route, but also, and maybe more importantly, the South Park was able to bring construction materials from Denver directly out to Buena Vista and hand them off to the Rio Grande Railroad. Okay. So that's like a hundred and some miles shorter than the Rio Grande having to take them down to Pueblo and bring them back up. So part of this, uh, getting these railroads to cooperate, um, sped the introduction of the rail line into Leadville. Okay. Um, so the real excitement in the 10 Mile District in 1880 was the prospect that the railroad would keep coming. Okay. So the railroad arrives in Leadville and they just keep their crews on and they keep building up the Arkansas Valley and over the pass into 10, into 10 Mile Creek. Okay. So the first year, in 18, by the end of 1880, they're already at Kokomo. So they've come through Robinson, they've stopped at Kokomo for the winter. The next year they come down as far as Wheeler, so that's still a little ways away from here. Okay. 
But in 1882, it was on through Frisco to Dillon, where it stopped. Okay? Now, at that time, they were building what they called the Blue River Extension. They didn't call it Blue River Branch. This railroad had big plans. Okay? So this was considered mainline trackage, if anything was ever mainline in the mountains. Okay? Um, so they got to Dillon, they got through Frisco and to Dillon in 1882, just weeks before the South Park Railroad also got into Dillon. We'll talk about them in a minute. So the line that stopped at Dillon for the Rio Grande was intended to turn and run to Breckenridge. They actually had a number of different plans over the years of where that line was going to go from Dillon. But it never went anywhere beyond Dillon. Okay. So the Rio Grande acquired... Um, they required their right-of-way in different ways. Because you don't get to just build a railroad anywhere you want, okay? They had to acquire rights to, put, to build a railroad. So they did that by acquiring a lot of their land from the United States government. And you'll see United States Act of 1875. Those sections were all places where no private ownership had taken place yet, okay? There were other places where there were people's names. Um, and it's really interesting that, they, um, that there are names that you still hear up here, if you know uh, the area history. So they're getting right away from private owners with names like Robinson, Wheeler, Pollock, Callahan, Dillon Mining Company. Okay. The right of way through Frisco was granted by city ordinance July 19th, 1882. The town of Frisco passed an ordinance that said the railroad can occupy streets and alleys to come through town. So the Rio Grande had that. They were the first railroad here. Um, now, the Rio Grande passed through town, but never had a depot here. Okay? They did have a section house. They had a bunkhouse, um, they had um, privy, they had loading platforms. This is a 1903 chain map of the area of Frisco where they drew out not only the railroad, they, they don't show curves and everything, everything here is in, in mile stretches, and they show all the various improvements, section house, bunkhouse, platforms, okay? Now this was in 1903. So not from the very beginning. There are snapshots of the, this information elsewhere in time. Um, Why did they want to get run the railroad to Dillon? What was the, the water, the draw? The, 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 the railroad came here for mining revenue, okay? But then it was a matter of where they're going to go. One of the master plans was they were going to turn up the Blue River to the north and go all the way to the Transcontinental Railroad. Okay, so basically up to Wyoming. Okay. They were also going to try and come down and beat the South Park to Breckenridge as a mining revenue source. They did not do that. Okay. They didn't make it. Um, the South Park got there first. Um, they were also interested in connecting um, with the Colorado Central that came west out of Denver and developing. Everybody wanted a shorter route between Denver and Leadville. And they also didn't get in a position to do that. Um, they did some other stuff, though. Mm, let's see, not my computer. OK, so this is actually a 1923 map. Um, it was um, done by the Rio Grande Railroad, and it was done as an exhibit to their um, abandonment uh, order when they were applying to get out of this area. Um, because in, they, even though they left the area originally in 1911, they never took the tracks out. So th the reason I want to show this one is it shows how the yellow line is the Rio Grande. So it's coming down through Frisco to Dillon and stops. The red line is the Colorado and Southern. So we'll talk about their route, which at that time was the Colorado and Southern. It was originally built as the Denver, South Park, and Pacific. Um, so the railroads had operating issues all along. 
This is actually a very tough picture to copy <coughs> because it's all snow. So this is a rotary snowplow train um, in the 10 Mile Canyon. And um, this is what it was like to operate a railroad in the wintertime. Okay? It was a factor on why even with revenue sources, the railroads couldn't make any money out here. Okay? Um, pardon me. So 1911 was actually the last year that the uh, Rio Grande branch was operated. Okay? Uh, they made a deal in 1911 with Colorado and Southern where they each gave up territories to each other. Okay? Um, triggered off the closure of the Alpine Tunnel on the Colorado and Southern way south of here. Okay? In 1919, the Rio Grande still had to file government reports with the Interstate Commerce Commission. So this is actually what was called field engineering notes. There's, this is somebody in the field who's uh, documenting all of the improvements that the railroad has um, all along the line. It, what happened with that is it became the valuation maps um, that were filed with the Interstate Commerce Commission. And the Rio Grande hadn't operated this line since 1911, but they still owned it. So they still had to document it as an owned but not operated route, okay? So they're showing in Frisco, down on the bottom portion, they're showing a siding, there is a section house, there is a bunk house, there is a platform, that's it, no depot, okay? There, there was never a depot here. Finally, in, <coughs> excuse me, it wasn't until 1924 that the Rio Grande removed their branch through Frisco all the way back to Leadville. So what was then, by then it was called the Blue River Branch, okay? So obviously not going on, their main line went on, you know, Tennessee Pass and out through Grand Junction into Utah. So they uh, hired um, a company out of Denver, Morse Brothers um, was the major scrapper of metals uh, in Colorado, in the Rocky Mountain West. And they came out and they used the contract uh, to remove the line uh, from Leadville to Dillon, okay? So that was in 1924. The railroad did not bring its own crews out here. It wasn't a good line to try and operate on the tracks to remove it because it had been abandoned so long. So the other, um, the other railroad that came to the area was the Denver, South Park, and Pacific, okay? So they came over the hill from Como um, into Dillon, and they were only a few weeks behind the Rio Grande in 1882, okay? They were almost there at the same time, um, which is part of the reason why Dillon kind of became the stopping point. Now, the South Park, they didn't need to turn toward Leadville, okay? Because they had that 1879 joint operating agreement where they could get to Leadville on the Rio Grande tracks along the Arkansas River between Buena Vista and Leadville, okay? So, um, what turned out in operation um, didn't match what Jay Gould had in mind for how these railroads were going to share the single route. So, it didn't, it wasn't a success because the revenues were to be shared equally. Okay, so the, the, no matter what traffic is on this line, the revenues generated go half to the South Park, half to the Rio Grande. The problem was that the Rio Grande generated maybe as much as 80% of the entire traffic on the line. Okay, so they didn't like that. Okay, they didn't like sharing that revenue. So even after the South Park paid half of the expenses, the, still the net revenue that was generated off the line had to be split with the South Park. Um, so the joint operating agreement was canceled and it was canceled to become effective in February of 1884. So the South Park is now on their own to find another route to Leadville. Okay. So they looked at several routes, but they settled on a route parallel to the Rio Grande from Dillon to Leadville, the line through Frisco. 
Okay? So uh, the new extension, the, the new line extension, was supposed to, um, let's see, I want to go back here. Okay. Again, the yellow line is the Rio Grande. The red line is the uh, South Park line. So the, the end line that, that shows coming in uh, in the upper right is actually the line from Breckenridge, and it comes into Dillon and was originally going to go directly to Frisco. It was going to parallel the uh, Rio Grande line. And they started to build it that way, and it's on a variety of their maps, but they never did that. They never finished it. So they moved the, the departure point for the line to Leadville to a place called uh, Dickey, uh, several miles uh, up the Blue River. So it ended up coming into Frisco, um, kind of skirting the edge of town, okay, and came around to and joined uh, the uh, shared right-of-way areas with the Rio Grande there on the west end of Frisco, okay. Um, so the, there were a variety of things that happened. Um, they had, they, they, the reason they went to Dickey is probably the important point. It saved them mileage to get to Frisco. It saved them grade, because if you think about the layout here, Dillon's downhill from here, okay? So they're coming down the Blue River from Breckenridge. They don't want to give up that grade and have to come back up. So that saved them mileage, it saved them grade, and it saved them contending with Rio Grande having a right-of-way through Frisco already, through the city streets, okay? So the South Park um, opened its line to Leadville in um, 1884. Now, they had to acquire right away, just like the Rio Grande did, okay? So this is a book we have at the museum. I couldn't bring it today because it's heavy, it's fragile, and it is in an exhibit. That's why I had to take a picture through the glass here. It's in an exhibit right now until October, but it is a primary research uh, document for us. So it lists all of the properties that the railroad went through, whether they acquired a right of way, whether they actually bought the property. Um, it, it also includes, of course, all the date information, who the grantors were, you know, who all these people were that were giving up this right of way. That happens to be open to Leadville. Um, for the display, but there's all sorts of hand-drawn, multicolor maps in this book. It's a fascinating, fascinating book. So that's also one of our primary resource materials when we're doing research on railroads in the South Park area. Um, so now we've got two railroads through Frisco, and they're operating basically, they're just operating as competitors, okay? for 25 years, okay? The problem is business levels were pretty erratic, costs were high, snow fighting was nasty, and there just wasn't enough volume to support two, um, to support two railroads. So um, I wanted to show you what things looked like when they were operating in the 10 Mile Canyon area. The top picture here is the siding that's out on the edge of um, Frisco, okay, because initially the siding was about the only facility here for the South Park. Um, there is a depot later that is actually just in the foreground. It would probably be just out of the picture um, in the foreground. The lower picture shows you both routes because that's a South Park work train headed toward um, Frisco. Okay, it's just up the river toward almost to, almost to Curtin. That's at the base of the road. Okay, and then the bridge is the Rio Grande's bridge crossing um, Ten Mile Creek. Okay, so um, so you had that going on, and the railroads, the lines were that close together in many many places. Okay. So, Say one of those was a siding? Yes. Yeah, they're just a passing track there, actually, for a number of years. 
And it's actually on the that map. That was owned by the South Park. So in relationship to this photo, the Rio Grande would have been off to the right. Yes, exactly. You'll see in another picture here in just a bit. So, um, so this is how they coexisted. But generally, the snow fighting um, was worse for the South Park on their line from here to Leadville because they weren't, they didn't get, they got second choice of, of routes of, of, and they were pushed up against the hill and the more open route was the Rio Grande, okay? Um, so despite big dreams of extensions and tunnels, both railroads had plans for these lines, okay? Um, this one, um, the uh, Colorado and Southern had actually planned to connect its other, the old Colorado Central line west out of Denver. They were going to connect from Keystone over to Georgetown. That happens to be the Vidler Tunnel under Argentine Pass. Okay? There's, I could show you more pictures of other proposed routes. There was the Loveland Pass route, the, you know, the great Atlantic and Pacific Tunnel route that would have connected with Silver Plume to Keystone, okay? Um, Rio Grande actually had um, intended to be first into, into the Dillon Keystone area and, um, and preempt uh, a, a piece of that tunnel connection for that shortcut to Denver, okay? Didn't happen, okay? This didn't happen. Actually, the Vidler Tunnel exists today. City of Golden owns it. Um, it's a water diversion tunnel finished in 1968. Um, so it did happen eventually, but it's a water tunnel and it takes water from that Peru Basin above Keystone to the north fork of, the, of Clear Creek and down into Denver. Um, so it's owned by Denver or by um, Golden's Water Department. Okay. Um, so in 1889, South Park's defunct, okay? So it um, is refinanced, goes in, become the Denver, Leadville, and Gunnison, okay? And it operates as that, well, it goes into receivership again then in 1894, bouncing along like a lot of railroads at the time. Um, that 1894 is not a coincidence, that's after the silver, uh, the Sherman Act was uh, repealed and silver uh, uh, coinage drops so it, it was the end of a lot of things. But in 1899, so almost 1900, the South Park gets incorporated into the new Colorado and Southern Railroad, okay? That's when these railroads really come together. So you know this map is early 1900s, okay? Because it includes the moniker for the Colorado and Southern Railroad, okay? Now, people here, seem to be pretty happy with this because there were news reports in the paper in January 7th, 1899, okay, when this was announced. Um, and the people of Frisco are delighted over the prospect of securing a depot building from the CNS. So they think they've got the in to get a depot because uh, my understanding is up until that time, there were no depots in Frisco, okay? So we get a boxcar depot, okay? So it's an old boxcar that was converted. When did it come? Well, we're not actually sure. We think it was about 1900, 1899, 1900. Um, it could even be the one that was the temporary depot at Kokomo, but they moved it out and built a new one starting in 1894. So they may have just moved it down here at some point. So I don't know for sure when the boxcar depot showed up here. If you've seen the Arcadia um, book series, there's one on Summit County, kind of a tan and brown book, whole series of them. They're on, there's probably 30 of them on just Colorado subjects. It's a publishing company uh, that's nationwide in scope. They say that the boxcar depot was 1882. Well, can't be because the South Park wasn't here in 1882. Didn't get here till 1884. Okay, so, um, so I think it's about 1900. But, um, but in 1906, what we do know is this is um, 
an AFE is an authorization for expenditure. Okay? So this is one, and the original is actually here, out of our collection. So this is the original documentation package uh, to build a replacement depot in Frisco. And um, it replaced, according to the AFE paperwork, it replaced a boxcar depot that burned. Okay. So what's really interesting is instead of waiting for winter, uh, the citizens of, this is the original, the citizens of Frisco petitioned the railroad to build a depot in Frisco. Okay. Now, if you look at this, it's signed by the city trustees, by the postmaster, hotel operator, a variety of citizens, the mayor, okay, to put a proper station in Frisco. Okay. Um, the AFE documents suggest that it was put there to replace the burned depot. If you read all of the details in here, in the correspondence, you find that didn't happen exactly like that. The depot didn't burn until after the petition had been submitted to the railroad for a while. So it makes you wonder if the boxcar depot um, was sped along its way by citizenry here. So don't really know uh, the answer to that. Um, but that's part that in the documentation of the AFE, um, you can't really tell for sure, okay? So the bottom picture here is the boxcar depot, okay? The location is not known for sure, okay? We know where the second upper depot is. That's the 1906 one, okay? That depot's out along the spur, that siding track that we looked at in the earlier picture. So it's out there on that edge of town, um, which was a perfectly appropriate. Now, some people wanted it moved closer to town, into town, but you had the new King Solomon Mine going. That was a big deal then, and it was opened in 1905. It's out that direction. So um, there was some back and forth, but the depot ends up going out there along their siding track which from an operation standpoint is what they really wanted anyway. They didn't want to put it where they didn't have a passing siding. So that is a 16 by 16 wood depot, except in future reports where it has varying dimensions. Okay, it happens. Um, so in 1908, uh, the Burlington Railroad, through its primary operation, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy acquires the Colorado and Southern and really begins their effort to get their railroad out of the narrow gauge railroad business. Okay. So uh, they have a, a couple of things that are going on. In 1910, uh, um, they have a second partial collapse of the Alpine Tunnel, okay, which is their main line Gunnison Division line that goes out uh, through the Continental Divide. Um, so they took the opportunity to close it permanently. They didn't want to maintain it anymore. So they come up with uh, an agreement between the Rio Grande, who had operations out there in the Gunnison area, um, and the Colorado and Southern, whereby the Rio Grande gives up their Blue River branch here in our area. So um, contract 1969, which we have, that's a CNS contract, but it's referred to as a joint operating agreement. Okay? And what it really does is they are agreeing who's going to give up which properties west of the Continental Divide, the Rio Grande gives up the Blue River branch, which was an unprofitable line for it anyway. 
Okay? So, but neither railroad actually transferred or abandoned the tracks that they're ceasing operations on. Okay? So the Rio Grande gives up the operation of the Blue River branch to the Colorado and Southern. Okay? So this is a telegram, February 13th, 1911. Um, this is the Rio Grande's side of it, where they're explaining what's going to happen with these properties. So the Colorado and Southern is giving up properties out around Gunnison and the Baldwin Mine branches and some things like that. But it also says that the CNS will take over uh, the Blue River branch of the DNRG. Okay. Well, they, they didn't take over anything because they never operated it. Um, People wondered for years why they didn't move their line over to the Rio Grande because it was better situated. But it was poorly built. It was going to take a lot of money. They just never got to it. So it was relinquished to the Colorado and Southern, but they didn't actually operate the branch because they already had a parallel branch all the way to Leadville. Okay. Um, also in 1910, the CNS ceased operations over Boreas Pass. So that's Breckenridge, Tacoma, main line to Denver. Okay. They gave up um, trying to operate that in the winter. Snow fighting was just too brutal and expense. There wasn't enough revenue. So they stopped for the winter. They had done that before. But come springtime, they didn't open it back up. So the city of Breckenridge famously sued to get the line reopened, okay? And they were successful. The railroad appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court, and the Colorado Supreme Court affirmed the original court's findings to reopen the road. So the CNS couldn't force, a, you know, an abandonment of that line. So they had to reopen the line to Denver. Here in Frisco, it didn't matter quite as much because they were still operating from Leadville as far as Breckenridge, okay? So through Frisco. But they, what the people here had lost was the shorter route to Denver, okay? Because the Rio Grande route, from, to go from here to Denver on the Rio Grande is 125 miles longer than to go on the South Park line. So, in 1915, the first time that the, Rio, that the Colorado and Southern formally applied to vacate um, the uh, entire South Park line, and they were turned down. They were tired of fighting. Now, this happens to be um, just the uphill from here. You're looking back toward... You're just east of Curtin, but you're looking back toward Frisco, okay? And I'm probably sta I'm, I'm obviously standing in somebody's way. Um, so this is, you know, it's snow like that all year long. To the left there is essentially the old Rio Grande line, okay? Which is gone because this picture is taken in 1929. This is part of a survey done by the Denver Water Board when they were looking at all of the railroads and particularly the drainages and when they were proposing Two Forks Dam over um, in South Park area. Um, so this was from their uh, collection of survey photos which we have at the Railroad Museum. So in there you've got basically where those power lines are and here you've got parallel, this is the way they operated 25 years, you've got parallel South Park and Rio Grande tracks. Um, so, with a, with a denial to abandon it, they're still working all the way through the 20s and the 30s. They're, they're trying periodically to abandon the, the rail line out here. So, this is a map from 1929. It's an exhibit to a petition to abandon the South Park Railroad. Okay? Um, what it shows here, the red line is the railroad. The green lines 
are roadways. They're showing why the railroad is superfluous and not needed for the communities out here. Um, so up in the Dillon Frisco area, you can see they're showing from Frisco, they're showing roads go back down. Actually, the green line through the middle would be Highway 9. Okay. Um, but this was, this was part of their effort to show why the railroad's not required to be here. Also, year by year, their financial situation gets worse and worse and worse. Okay. Um, in 1926, for instance, the population of Frisco was 100. Okay. Leadville was 3,200. Not 15,000, it was 3,200. Robinson was zero. Como, or Kokomo was 150. There was still some mining there. Keystone was 25. And Breckenridge was 950. Okay, decent size. Uh, now, it wasn't until 1937 um, that this AFE was generated based on the approval of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1937, finally, to abandon the South Park Line. This um, AFE was written to abandon from Waterton Canyon, south of Denver, um, all the way to Climax, okay, they did not abandon the section from Leadville to Climax. Okay. So um, that section of road operated clear up to the end of, the, of uh, mining operations there. And uh, it's still the, it's the only surviving section of the South Park line. It's still operated by the Leadville, Colorado, and Southern uh, Tourist Line. So it is a piece of railroad history in that it was part of uh, the South Park's line uh, to Leadville. Okay. Um, the Frisco Depot is listed on a detail schedule that it was abandoned in 1938 along with the station sign. Okay. Now, abandonment um, you know, doesn't mean <laughs> Uh, it doesn't mean it was dismantled, um, doesn't mean it was scrapped, it just means they wrote it off their books. Okay? In a summary letter to the, the commissioner of the Interstate Commerce Commission, the railroad says that the buildings were sold in place. Okay? So they were sold to somebody. So does, there, does that depot still exist? I don't know the answer to that, but it was sold by the railroad to somebody for maybe 30 bucks. It may have stayed out there. It was likely relocated, okay? The railroad sold property that they owned here, but they also relinquished, if they had just right of way through somebody's property, that reverted to that property owner. The right of way reverts, okay? If they owned it outright, if they had a warranty deed interest, a fee interest in the property, then they sold it. They didn't keep any of that property, okay? So, um, so for me, a remaining mystery is uh, what happened to the Frisco Depot. And I figured somebody here probably already knew that. No go? Okay, I'm disappointed in you. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about railroad history in this area or any place else, we have all sorts of things um, that are of interest at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. We have uh, uh, corporate records of the railroads. Okay? In some cases, there are holes in them, but we have a lot of them. We have land records and maps. We have a lot of system maps, uh, station maps, spur industrial maps, uh, timetables. Uh, we particularly have collections, both for the Rio Grande and the Colorado and Southern, we have their authorization for expenditure collection, which is a, a wonderful history of what the railroad did by what they spent money on, non-operating money. This was money that they had to get approval to spend. Okay. We have timetables. Uh, I have some things up here that are either reproductions from or originals of things. I have the original AFE for the abandonment of the South Park Line. I have the original AFE from the building of the depot here. 
Um, we also have some materials. Um, this is out of a research collection from a private party. He's a retired engineer in Denver. A whole collection of materials about the Snake River and Dillon area, um, covers a little bit of Frisco. Um, this happens to be an overlay map precision uh, located. This is Dillon Reservoir, the town of Dickey, which is where the um, South Park line broke off to come over through Frisco. So th the larger red line is Highway 9. It's coming around, makes the turn into Frisco. If you're looking out into the water, that's the location of Dickey. And the smaller red line to the left is the line, the railroad line to Frisco. So he's got some marvelous stuff in his collection. He's also got a whole uh, research report on the Summit County power plant that was down just the other side of Dillon, um, operated 20 some years. Um, so some fascinating things. Uh, so I welcome you, uh, invite you to look at uh, materials that we brought. I'm here to answer any questions for you. And I'm over a few minutes. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you.